Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate, or you can go to Buy Me a Cup of Coffee slash Craig U. All of these links are also in my show notes. And for people who donate, I have various levels of benefits. For $5, you get a thank you at the start of the next episode of Canadian History X, Canada's Great War, and from John to Justin, and on social media. For $10, you get everything from the $5, plus this episode is sponsored by with your name at the start. Also, I'll state it's sponsored by you on social media. For $20, everything from the $5 and $10, plus a second episode sponsored by you and promotion of something you're working on. And for $50, everything from the $5, $10, and $20, plus you get to choose a topic for me to cover on Canadian History X. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G, B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram and TikTok where I put up daily videos about Canada's history. Just go to my username, Bairdo37. And you can find weekly videos on Canada's history on my YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash c slash CanadianHistoryX. If you want to find transcripts of every episode I've ever done, you can go to my website, CanadaEHX.com. And there's over 700 posts on Canada's history there. In the 1530s, Jacques Cartier would cement his name in history by sailing to what would eventually be Canada. He would be one of the first Europeans that many indigenous groups would meet, and in a pattern that would become all too familiar, his interactions with the indigenous were far from pleasant. On April 20th, 1534, Cartier set sail under the banner of King Francis I of France, with the goal of finding a western passage to get to Asia. He was also tasked with finding islands and lands where gold could be collected, as the Spanish were doing in South America. After 20 days, Cartier reached Newfoundland on May 10th and sailed around the Maritimes area, reaching Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, and Labrador. During one stop in the Magdalen Islands, his crew would slaughter 1,000 birds, most of which were great auks, a species that would be extinct by 1852. It was also here that he met the indigenous people for the first time. Some trading occurred, and it's believed the group he interacted with were the Mi'kmaq. They were said to greet his ship with two fleets of canoes, 40 to 50 in all. Cartier is said to have fired light artillery to frighten them away. The following day, nine canoes arrived at the ship, and the Mi'kmaq held up first to show they want to trade. Cartier then sent two men ashore with iron goods and knives, and trading would occur between the two groups. Maclean's in 1934 would claim that Cartier wrote, quote, the next day, some of these Indians came in nine canoes to the point at the mouth of the cove, where we lay anchored with our ships. We sent two men on shore to offer them knives and other iron goods, end quote. He would describe the indigenous, stating, quote, We perceive that they are people who would be easy to convert, but these people may well be called savage, for they are the sorriest folk there could ever be in the world. They are wonderful thieves and steal everything they can carry off, end quote. I'd like to point out that most of the quotes in this are going to be from the written recollections of Cartier, so they're going to be heavily weighted to a European point of view. It's also said that Cartier encountered the Beothuk on Newfoundland, and he would describe how they rubbed red ochre over their bodies, clothing, and hair, and it would be from this that the term Red Indian would come from. Throughout the Quebec region, which had been inhabited for upwards of 9,000 years by the indigenous, there were several indigenous groups, including some groups of Cree, the Inuit to the north, the Mi'kmaq, Algonquin, and Escapi. For the indigenous, the St. Lawrence was steeped in lore. One island located to the east along the river of the current Quebec City was said to be the oldest spot on earth by the indigenous, a patch of land that rose above the floods that covered the world in its beginning. It was around this location that Cartier planted a cross on July 24th and claimed the territory for France. It was also there he met the St. Lawrence Iroquois for the first time. An estimated 300 Iroquois encountered him, and Cartier described how they slept under overturned canoes and wore few skins over their bodies. The indigenous are said to have welcomed the French with songs and dance and then began to trade with them. 
At first, the interaction was pleasant, but after erecting the cross, the mood completely changed as the Iroquois seemed to understand that he was claiming their territory. Cartier would describe that the cross was erected in front of 200 men, women, and children in 40 boats. He said that nine of the indigenous had come 700 kilometers to meet the French. The leader of this group was Donacona, or Donacona, who was not happy about the cross that had been put onto the ground on his land. It was written of the interaction, quote, After we were returned to our ships, their captain, clad with an old bear's skin, with three of his sons and a brother of his with him, came unto us in one of the boats, but they came not so near as they want to do so. There he made a long oration unto us, showing us the cross we had set up, and making a cross with two fingers. Then did he show all the country about us." Quote. Meeting with Donacana, Cartier was shown five scalps taken during a war with the Micmac the previous spring. And after presenting gifts, Cartier suddenly seized the sons of Donacana, as well as the chief himself, despite efforts with the other indigenous to stop him. The sons were held by Carche, who said he would return them one year later upon his arrival back in the area. It was written of this interaction, quote, Then did we show them with signs that the cross was but only set up to be as a light and leader which ways to enter into the port, and that we would shortly come again, and bring good store of iron wares and other things, but that we would take two of his children with us, and afterwards bring them to the said port again, and so we clothed two of them in shirts and colored coats. We gave to each one, one of these three that went back, a hatchet and some knives, which made them very glad. After these were gone, and had told the news unto their fellows, in the afternoon they came to our ships six boats of them, with six men and every one, to take their farewells of those two we had detained to take with us." End quote. Over the course of about 500 episodes, one thing I've found with Canadian history and history in general is that times change and styles change. What was rare at one point becomes common at another. If you want to take advantage of the style of today, then Manscaped is the company for you. Manscaped has been providing safe products for men to groom themselves for years without the danger of sharp blades causing a very uncomfortable injury. Right now, Manscaped is offering all my listeners 20% off of their order. I recently received my first kit from Manscaped and it comes with everything to groom yourself from top to bottom. Even your nose and ears can be groomed with their patented Weed Whacker Trimmer. With their lotions, powders, and trimmers, you can feel your best as you go about your day. Once again, that is 20% off with the offer code EHX at manscaped.com. Choose your products and enter the code at the checkout to save today. You can also click the link in my show notes. In France, the sons would tell stories of the Kingdom of Saguenay and what could be found there. It was likely they told these stories of riches in order to be returned back to Canada as soon as possible. It would also be said that the French were simply hearing what they wanted to hear. On May 19, 1535, Cartier began a second voyage with three ships, 110 men, and the two indigenous men he had taken with him. His ships were the Great Stout, the Lesser Stout, and the Merlin. At this point, he sailed to Stadacona, where Donacona was located. I did an episode on Stadacona and Hochelega already, so I don't want to talk too much about the communities here, but Stadacona was located where Quebec City is now. Cartier would apparently ask one of Donacona's sons what the river's name was, and he was told it was a river without end. Upon returning the two sons to Stadacona, Donacona embraced his sons and they told him about France. Gifts were then exchanged, and for a while the mood was festive, but it would slowly change to guarded suspicion. Cartier would write, quote, And all come o'er towards our ship showing many signs of joy, except the two men we had brought with us, to wit, Tagone and Damagaya, who were altogether changed in their attitude and goodwill, and refused to come on board our ships, although many times begged to do so. At this time we began somewhat to distrust them, end quote. In Stadacona, Cartier made the first reference to the name of Canada, to designate the territory of the area. The name comes from the Huron Iroquois word, Kanata, which meant village, but was misinterpreted as newly discovered land. Cartier used the name to describe not only Stadacona, but the surrounding land and the river itself. Cartier would also name the inhabitants of the area Canadians, and name the St. Lawrence River Canada River. He wrote, quote, On the 13th of the month we set out from St. Lawrence Bay and headed towards the west, made our way as far as the cape on the south side 
and it was told us by the two Indians we had captured on our first voyage that this cape formed part of the land on the south, which was an island, and that to the south of it lay the route from the Hongedo, where he had seized them on the first voyage to Canada, and that two days' journey from this cape and island began the kingdom of Saguenay on the north shore as one made one's way to this Canada." End quote. What's he saying, Father? Uh, Commandant Cartier, he's saying uh, this nation's name is uh, Canada. Canada. Ah, <laughs> uh, Canada. Uh, big, big pardon, sir, but. The word he used, I think it really means those houses down no, there. No, no, believe me, I know the word. It means nation, and Canada is its name. But I'm sure it means the houses, the village. It was at Stadacona that Cartier left his main ship and continued on in a smaller ship to Hochelega, located where Montreal is now. The indigenous had tried to stop Cartier from going on to Hochelega, and he would write, quote, They dressed up three men as devils, arraying them in black and white dog skins with horns as long as one's arm, and their faces colored black as coal, and unknown to us put them into a canoe, end quote. The two sons warned Cartier that their god, as well as Christian deities, had announced at Hochelega that there would be much ice and snow, and that they would all perish. And while the sons likely knew that Cartier and France had eyes on the land of the indigenous, Carche did not heed the warning. As it turned out, though, it would indeed be an accurate warning for the coming winter. Carche would arrive at the village on October 2nd, 1535. At the time, Hochelega had a population of a few thousand people, and 1,000 people came to the river edge to greet Carche and his men. It is believed that Carche landed where the Carche Bridge is now located, and it was there he would name the nearby mountain Mount Royal. The encounter was written down stating, quote, during this interval we came across on the way many of the people of the country who brought us fish and other provisions, at the same time dancing and showing great joy at our coming. And in order to win and keep their friendship, the captain made them a present of some knives, beads, and other small trifles, whereat they were greatly pleased. And on reaching Hochelega, there came to meet us more than a thousand persons, men, women, and children, who gave us as good as a welcome as ever father gave to his son, making great signs of joy." End quote. Due to the rapids, Cartier could not progress any further, but he was sure he had come across the Northwest Passage, and that the rapids were the only thing preventing him from reaching China. Of course, there was an entire continent in the way, but he had no way of knowing that. The rapids are named Lachine, after the French word Lachine, which means China. Cartier spent two days at Hochelega before going back to Stadacona on October 11th, and in that area, he would spend the winter where his men built a small fort and collected provisions. During this time, scurvy broke out among the crew, and it was the indigenous who brought a concoction that cured scurvy, saving the lives of many of Cartier's men and allowing 85 of his men to survive the winter. As it would turn out, the cedar concoction that they gave the men was loaded with vitamin C. But Cartier did not see the indigenous curing his men. In his mind, it was God. Now having brought his sons back to Donacana, Cartier made the decision to suddenly kidnap the chief and take him to France against his will. According to legend, he did this by organizing a giant feast on his ship, and he invited Donacana, his sons, and villagers to attend. They were suspicious to attend, but they came for the feast, and as soon as they were aboard, Cartier took them prisoner. He wanted Donacana to tell the story of the country to the north where he believed was full of gold, rubies, and other treasures. Along with Donacana, Cartier had forced nine from the tribe, including his sons, to go to France. Donacana would tell the king of France of riches to be found in Canada and beg to be returned back to his home. And while Donacana, by all accounts, was apparently treated well in France, and Cartier told him he would return after a year, Donacana would never return back to his home. He would die in France sometime around 1539. Of all nine indigenous, all but one girl died in France, and her fate is unknown. Cartier returned to Canada in 1541 when he brought back no one from the original voyage he had taken years earlier. 
He simply told the new chief that Donnacona had passed away, and everyone was rich and happy. According to accounts, he is said to have stated, quote, They remained in France where they were living as great lords. They were married and had no desire to return to their country. End quote. Once again, Cartier met with the indigenous, but he found their large numbers to be worrisome, as well as what he called their show of joy. He would decide not to make a settlement in the area, and he chose to build a fort down the river. On September 7, 1541, Cartier traveled with a few indigenous and longboats to find the fabled Saguenay, where he believed there was gold and riches. Once again, rapids prevented him from going farther than Hochelaga. By the time he returned to the fort, the Iroquois were no longer making friendly visits to the fort or trading any food with the French. They spent their time in the woods around the fort, likely growing suspicious of the French and Carche by this point. It is believed, based on the accounts of the French sailors, that the indigenous attacked the fort and 35 French died in the attack before they could get back behind the fort walls. In June 1542, Carche left the fort and sailed back to Canada, never to return. His fort would be put under the command of Jean-Francois Roboval, the first lieutenant general of French Canada, but it would be abandoned one year later due to disease, foul weather, and the growing hostility of the indigenous to the French. It would be decades before the French would return to set up a new community on the site of the indigenous settlement. It would be called Quebec, and by this point the huge settlements of Hochelega and Stadacana were gone, as were the Iroquois that Cartier had encountered. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Carche and the Indigenous. Next week, we're looking at the Confederation Bridge. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. And you can donate to the podcast by going to Canada ehx.com and clicking donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Keelan Pregnitz, Michael Matthews, Joanna Parker, Jeff Dahl, Vobs, Robert Page, Richard D., Colin Johnson, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, an anonymous patron that I truly do appreciate, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseeth, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Information from This is Canadiana, Canadian Encyclopedia, Native American Roots, Media Co-op, Wikipedia, McLean, CBC, Canada.ca, Historica Canada, and McGill University. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.